TXRX Systems has been producing equipment for use in LAM Mobile Radio, LMR, since 1976. Products are used to enhance the receive characteristics of base station and repeater sites to give portables, mobiles, and handhelds better range and capabilities, to reduce the number of feed lines on the tower, reduce tower loading, to simplify installation of control sites, and many other applications. Section 1 of this material introduced the larger components, and this section will cover more of the equipment used at sites. TXRX Systems has a long history with transmit and receive equipment and offers some of the most advanced and reliable components available. This training module will cover more of the basics of site systems, technology, and application. More detailed information will be included in following sections. This second section in this series introduces more LMR site equipment and will include the topics listed in the index here. For a quick reference, you will find the information on the slides numbered in this module. As reviewed in the LMR Equipment Overview Part 1 module, many factors impact coverage, including transmitter power output, or TPO, antenna type and gain, height above average terrain, or HAAT, the frequency range of the system, and system balance. All these factors must be considered in the system design in order to determine coverage. The components included in this module will impact coverage as well as helping to give consistent, solid communication. Several assumptions are made when the design engineer starts putting together site designs, including all losses and gains. Every component in the system either impacts the design positively or negatively as the signal goes through the system from transmitter to antenna and ultimately to the receiver. Typically, all components of a system are designed to have a 50 ohm impedance and must be tested in order to be certain that they all meet specification and fit together electrically as well as mechanically. Coverage considerations should also include external factors to a system such as site noise, interference, and issues caused by poor installation or rough handling of equipment. All these training modules focus on equipment produced by TXRX Systems of Angola, New York, a company in the Combalent Group. All the basic concepts presented are applicable to all RF sites and will be valuable resources in training new technicians and engineers, as well as review for those established in the industry. Not included in this material are site equipment such as the building or shelter, power sources for the site, data connections, licenses, and other topics as listed on the slide. In the previous section, we covered the major categories of site equipment, including combiners and multi-couplers, duplexers, TTAs, antennas, transmission line, and connectors. Some topics were covered very briefly and need further explanation, while some not included will be discussed. Land mobile radio sites are complex, but with a basic understanding of the major components of the system and how they fit together, the engineer or technician will be better equipped to handle system design, installation, optimization, and troubleshooting. Topics included in this module are base station antennas, circulators and isolators, and control station combiners. As before, we will not go into detail in this section on any one of these topics, but will introduce the products. For more topics and information, please review the topics posted on the TXRX website, txrx.com, under the Resources menu. The major components in an RF system are the ones that we pay the most attention to during routine maintenance and troubleshooting, but we need to be aware of all the other parts of our systems, understanding the individual specifications, knowing where they are in the system and what role they play in making the system work. In the diagram shown, the transceivers, the combiner and receive multicoupler, and the tower top amplifier may all be working properly, but the receive preselector may have been specified with the incorrect passband, 
too narrow for use in this system, not passing all the channels needed or attenuating some. Or it may be too wide, allowing strong interfering signals to reach the receivers. The loads on the isolators on the combiner may be too hot to touch, but everything seems to be working correctly. Following an electrical storm, coverage drops, but there are no direct hits on the tower. An ice storm has coated the tower and everything on it with half an inch of ice, and again, coverage falters when the radios are needed most during all the traffic accidents due to the ice on the highways. Understanding what each device does and where it is in the system will help the technician troubleshoot and repair the system when needed. In the most basic form, the antenna is a piece of wire in the air. When receiving, an electromagnetic signal passes over the surface of the antenna and induces a voltage into the antenna, causing current flow. When transmitting, current flows in the antenna, which causes an electromagnetic signal to radiate from the antenna. This is an oversimplification and all of the formulas that define signal flow in a circuit apply to the antenna on the tower. It is a transducer, taking high frequency energy and turning it into a radiated electromagnetic field and vice versa. When an antenna is mounted on the tower, it is considered as either a transmit or receive antenna, but all antennas are always both transmit and receive, a condition known as reciprocity. Any time an electromagnetic wave passes over the surface of the antenna, it receives. Any time a current flows within the antenna, it transmits. Antennas operate best or have the highest efficiency on those frequencies whose wavelength most closely match the mechanical length of the antenna. Antennas transmit or receive in specific patterns. There is no magic in antennas. They are not amplifiers and cannot create additional energy. They redirect the field. On the sweep on this slide, it shows that the antenna has a defined frequency range. At the lowest points on the sweep, the antenna transmits or receives with the highest efficiency. The sweep shows the return loss, which is one way of describing how well the antenna accepts power. The lower the return loss, the better the antenna accepts the applied power. The generally accepted specification is NEG 14 dB return loss, which is equal to 96% of the power being transmitted with 4% reflected back to the source, which is also equal to a VISWAR of 1.4 to 1. Higher reflected power or VISWAR is considered unacceptable and will degrade system performance. Antennas come in many shapes and sizes, and with them come differences in patterns and coverage. The antenna's pattern is determined primarily by the physical shape, size, and arrangement of the elements of the antenna. A simple dipole antenna can be constructed from a half wavelength of exposed wire. Dipoles are omnidirectional, meaning they radiate equally well in all directions in the horizontal plane and have a donut-shaped pattern at 90 degrees to their main axis. Several terms are used to describe dipoles and other types of antennas. A unity gain antenna means that the antenna's radiated power in the main part of its pattern is equal to the antenna's input power. A unity gain antenna is said to have zero dBD gain, where dBD is decibels of gain referenced to a dipole antenna. DBD is the most common way of specifying gain of an antenna in the land mobile industry. Placing multiple dipoles above each other in a single tube will produce additional signal laterally when compared to a dipole antenna. Again, coverage and gain result because of the redirecting of the signal into a specific area of the antenna's pattern. Using multiple elements with a collinear or corporate feed causes the signals to be sent to each dipole in the proper phase. Less signal is sent vertically, more is sent horizontally, and the antenna achieves lateral gain. For most land mobile radio applications, signal going straight up in the air is not useful, but signal sent toward the horizon improves system coverage. 
Yagi antennas, corner reflectors, log periodic, and panel antennas use various mechanical arrangements of multiple elements to achieve directionality, and the gain is based on the number of elements involved. The elements are also phased to achieve the desired signal patterns. As the number of elements increase, the pattern becomes narrower and the gain higher. Be aware that Yagi antennas have a back lobe and side lobes, making alignment critical. Briefly, an isotropic antenna is a theoretical antenna that radiates equally well in all directions in free space. The best real world example would be a star in space. The isotropic antenna is known as a theoretical construct. It cannot be built. It is used to specify gain, and a dipole antenna is said to have 2.15 dB of gain when compared to an isotropic antenna. The dipole antenna radiates in a donut-shaped pattern, redirecting the signals that would be off the ends when compared to an isotropic antenna to the sides, producing gain over an isotropic antenna. Down tilting antennas is another way of putting signals where they are needed. Dipole antennas transmit at 90 degrees to the long axis of the antenna. The curvature of the earth results in signals near the edges of coverage going over system users, reducing coverage. To improve coverage at the fringe, antennas are down tilted slightly, resulting in greater signal strength in these areas. Down tilt antennas are also used to improve close in coverage when the antenna site is located very high above the desired coverage area, such as on a mountain or tower. There are two types of down tilted antennas electrically down tilted and mechanically down tilted. Electrically down tilted antennas look the same on the tower as standard antennas and are mounted vertically just the same as non down tilted antennas. Typically, down tilt is between 4 and 6 degrees, but can be more or less depending on the requirements of topography. Electrical down tilt is usually the result of elements being fed signals at slightly different phases, which results in down tilt. Another method of achieving down tilt is to place the dipoles vertically closer together and feed them in phase. The pattern on the slide shows a 6 degree down tilted signal in green while the purple sweep is of a non-down-tilted signal. Mechanically down-tilted antennas use mounting hardware that gives the signal the down-tilt needed. A standard dipole antenna cannot be down-tilted in one direction without up-tilting on the opposite side. Normally, mechanical down-tilt uses sectorized antennas, such as the panel antenna shown used for cellular coverage. The results are the same, but the number of antennas required for 360 degrees of coverage increases. In some instances, antennas may need to be mounted upside down or inverse mounted. Installers need to be sure that the antenna drain plug is moved to the opposite end of the antenna or it will fill with water. System design engineers must be careful to order the proper antennas as an electrically down tilted antenna Inverse mounted results in up tilt and decreases coverage. The selection of site antennas is one of the most important factors in determining coverage and should be considered for both transmit and receive antennas. The frequency range of the system is one of the first considerations. In the lower frequency ranges, such as VHF and UHF, individual transmit and receive antennas may be required, as the operating range for these antennas may be limited. Remember that the receive channels need more help than the transmit channels. If the same antenna model is used for both transmit and receive, be sure you know the isolation requirements and whether the antenna meets those requirements. Gain and down tilt have been defined and will have a great effect on the resulting coverage pattern. As the gain of an antenna increases in one plane or direction, it may decrease in other planes or directions. Antenna manufacturers supply radiation patterns showing the expected or nominal gain and down tilt, which can be used in software packages to plot the resulting coverage area and pattern. 
be careful when mounting the antenna that the pattern and down tilt be considered, that the antenna is aimed properly, and that if inverse mounted, that it is down tilted correctly. Antenna PIP ratings are a bit more difficult, but as systems began using digital encoding of their signals, it became vitally important. PIP is peak instantaneous power. Before digital, average power and sometimes peak power were used to rate antennas. Because of the values used to encode signals digitally, peak power levels may be very short, but very, very high. And when combined with the other channels digitally encoded, they may reach destructive levels if the antenna is not rated to handle them. Remember that a system has the highest number of channels in use during an emergency, during a disaster. System failure at these times is not acceptable. PIM is the specification for how much passive intermodulation an antenna will produce in the presence of multiple carriers. It is the value of the IM compared to the signal levels going across or through the antenna, DBC, decibels of noise produced compared to signal levels. The accepted industry standard is that PIM should be at NEG 150 DBC or more. Anything mounted on the tower has to be able to survive wind and icing conditions. Wind conditions vary by where the site is located, and typically antenna manufacturers rate the antennas for average sustained wind speeds. Be sure to know what the requirements are for your sites and that the antennas are rated to survive those conditions. The other weather condition that the antenna must survive is lightning. Consider the antenna's lightning survivability rating before specifying it for your site or system. TXRX Systems has built antennas for decades. The 101 series antennas are omnidirectional broadband base station antennas capable of carrying up to one kilowatt. The antennas are constructed of a five chamber extrusion acting as the central core of the antenna, incorporating a corporate feed design with equal in-phase power fed to each element. The design results in excellent vertical pattern control and shaping, low loss, and beam tilt that is uniform across the operating bandwidth of the antenna. TXRX manufactures antennas in the UHF and 7, 8, and 900 megahertz ranges. All are very broadband, covering much of the band with a single model or in segments of the band depending on the need of the system. Power ratings are very high, 500 watts using N connectors and 1 kilowatt using 716 DIN connectors. UHF models cover two ranges, 380 to 430 MHz and 450 to 512 MHz. Both models are rated at 10 dBD of gain when compared to a dipole antenna. All models are available for invert mounting and models are rated at 0, 3, or 6 degrees of down tilt. In the upper frequency ranges, the 746 to 960 MHz range, TXRX produces models that cover the 700 and 800 MHz bands, the 800 MHz range, and a combination of 800 and 900 MHz transmit and receive frequencies in those ranges. All models offer significant gain, and custom down tilt can be specified by contacting the factory. Many concepts in RF and microwave communications may seem complicated or even magical to the technician left to figure them out. Our goal is to provide enough information to help you understand and troubleshoot the components in a system. Think of the circulator as a device that acts like a traffic circle with all the cars going in the same direction. If all of the traffic, or signal in our case, goes in the right direction, things work well and traffic flows efficiently. If someone went the wrong way around a traffic circle, opposition would be severe. The same happens in circulators and isolators. The circulator is a device with three connectors on it 120 degrees apart around a circle. The circle is the plate assembly inside the circulator. Signals will always move in the forward direction, 
one to two or two to three or three to one with little or no loss approximately one quarter of a db the electromagnetic properties of the device keep all the signals going in the forward direction a circulator becomes an isolator when a load is put on one of the ports of the device normally port three but if it is hooked into the system correctly any port can be terminated Normally, the output of the transmitter is attached to port 1, the antenna to port 2, and the load is on port 3. The signal is applied to port 1 and continues to port 2, seeing very little loss, and goes out that port to the antenna. Transmitters do not want to see power coming back in on their output port, which results in the mixing of signals called intermodulation. It may also result in damage to the transmitter depending on the signal levels flowing back into the transmitter caused by problems in the combiner, transmission line, or antenna. Any signal coming in on port 2 of the isolator, the antenna port, goes in the forward direction to port 3, where it is absorbed by the load, protecting the transmitter. The operation of a ferrite isolator has been discussed briefly, and the basic theory behind the operation has been laid out. An isolator is a circulator with a load on one port, typically port 3. RF energy enters port 1 and flows in the forward direction clockwise to port 2, with very little loss. If port 2 is terminated in a 50 ohm device like an antenna, the energy will go out port 2 to the antenna. If the port is not loaded properly, some of the energy will continue to port 3 and the load. Any RF coming in on the antenna and entering port 2 will flow to port 3 in the forward direction and be absorbed by the load. If some of the RF is not absorbed by the load, it would continue to port 1, but the amount of energy not absorbed by the load is very, very small. The insertion loss for isolators is very low, about a quarter of a dB in the forward direction, but very high, 25 dB in the reverse direction. The ability of the load on port 3 to absorb the energy arriving there is the limiting factor in the reverse isolation of the device. Any signal entering port 2 from the antenna is attenuated by 25 dB trying to flow to port 1 because it is absorbed by the load on port 3. Because of electromagnetic fields set up in the ferrite disks, RF is prevented from flowing from port 1 to port 3 and from port 3 to port 2. An isolator is the most common use for circulators. The isolator is placed on the output of a transmitter to prevent high-level RF signals from coming back down the antenna into the transmitter. A power amplifier is by design a nonlinear device, and if other signals are allowed to enter the power amplifier at its output, they would mix and produce intermodulation. To prevent this, every transmitter installed on sites with other transmitters must have an isolator installed at its output. On sites where transmitters are co-located with other transmitters, it may be necessary to install dual isolators in order to give enough isolation to the transmitters and keep site noise to a minimum. Dual isolators are two isolators combined in a single housing or two isolators in series. This arrangement can give over 50 dB of isolation with only half a dB of attenuation in the forward direction. Dual isolators are also commonly used on combiners where several transmitters output to a single antenna. When used on a combiner, the isolator's power handling capacity must be considered, matching the loads to the output power of the transmitters. A combiner will normally provide a good impedance match and transfer the energy to the antenna. If a mismatch occurs, such as caused by lightning strikes, icing, or other site or tower conditions, transmit energy will be sent back to the load closest to the antenna, which must be rated for the transmitter's output. As a rule, the first dummy load is equal to the power output of the transmitter. Since most of the power will be dissipated by the first load, the second load does not have to be as large and is normally rated for a few watts. 
Isolators are nonlinear and produce even order harmonics, requiring the installation of a harmonic filter or bandpass cavity between the isolator and the antenna. In a combiner application, the combiner's cavities provide sufficient protection and eliminates the need for a separate harmonic filter. In some cases, isolators can produce a third order intermodulation product when enough energy is present from other transmitters at the combiner's output. Additional isolation between the isolator and the combiner's cavities may eliminate this problem. TXRX supplies isolators for LMR sites as a protection device to protect the transmitters on site and other systems as well. An isolator does exactly that, isolates one transmitter from another. It protects a transmitter by keeping the output of the other transmitters from entering it in the reverse direction. Think of it as a one-way valve, keeping RF flowing in one direction from the individual transmitters to the system antenna. This also reduces the risk of intermodulation, lowering the mixing of signals in the finals of on-site transmitters. Isolators protect the transmitters in the case of system failures of antennas or transmission lines, both of which can cause high reflected power coming back into the transmitter. Many systems cut down the expense of a site by using existing towers, mounting equipment with other operators. Those signals and any noise caused by other systems will also end up in the loads of the isolator, saving your transmitter. Isolators should never be installed following a combiner or at any point in a system where multiple signals exist together in a feed line or component. Isolators are used only where a single signal is being carried because an isolator will produce high levels of intermodulation. The materials used in the isolator are set up as ideal mix points. So in the forward direction, do not mix signals in the isolator. In the reverse direction, the signals and IM products will go into the load and be terminated. As systems are being developed using higher power and newer modulation and encoding techniques, new isolators are being developed with newer ceramic materials to meet the needs. Be sure that you know your system's requirements before specifying isolators. Using circulators, isolators, and hybrid couplers, it is possible to build combiners that are small and allow multiple control stations to be connected to one or two antennas. Control stations are basically half-duplex devices transmitting and receiving on the same transmission line. The control station combiner allows these stations to be connected together while keeping the high-level transmit power out of the control station receivers, reducing the risk of intermodulation and harmonics. Remember that in the forward direction indicated by the arrows on the isolators in the diagram that there would be very low loss, about half a dB, while in the reverse direction there would be very high loss between 60 and 70 dB for TXRX CSCs. The control station transmit signal enters the combiner and flows through the circulator and dual isolators in the forward direction as indicated by the red signal path. It is combined with other transmit signals using hybrid couplers and is then sent to the transmit antenna. Any transmit signals coming in on the transmit antenna go through the couplers in the reverse direction and then to the isolator loads producing 60 to 70 dB of isolation. Receive channels coming in on the receive antenna see the loss of the four-way coupler and then the circulator loss before entering the receiver. TXRX Systems Short Haul Control Station Combiners are one of the simplest and most economical combiners available. Short haul control station combiners use 20 dB couplers to reduce the combined transmit and receive signals to gain the isolation needed to feed a single antenna. The reduction can be achieved by using either standard power splitters or hybrid couplers. Isolation is the result of the 20 dB of coupling on the ports and the isolation of the power splitter. 
with 20 dB isolation in the sampling port and 20 dB isolation between the sampling ports, the total isolation available is over 60 dB in all cases. Short haul CSCs will have a significant loss between the control station and the antenna. This loss will be on the order of 30 dB or more depending upon the number of stations the combiner is designed to accommodate. For control stations that are located only a short distance from the system infrastructure site, this loss is not normally a problem. If less loss is required, then a long haul or standard combiner would be recommended. TXRX Systems designs and manufactures combiners, including control station combiners. Control station combiners, or CSCs, allow the lower power control centers or control stations to combine multiple transmitter outputs onto a single transmission line to a single antenna. This not only reduces the number of feed lines and antennas, it lowers the risk of intermodulation and harmonic output. The use of CSEs results in consistent radio-to-radio -radio isolation, regardless of the individual transmit or receive operating mode, or antenna isolation characteristics. CSEs from TXRX are available in two different versions, standard and short haul. Standard CSEs are constructed using isolators and are more frequency sensitive, being manufactured for specific frequency ranges. Short-haul CSCs are built using couplers and are usually very broadband, covering 100 MHz to 1000 MHz. Both are available with channel configurations in multiples of four, and both work in either analog or digital applications. Standard CSC models are set up to cover either the 700 or 800 MHz transmit and receive bands, or one model which covers both the 700 and 800 MHz bands. The more broadband unit has slightly lower isolation and lower power handling capability. Isolation is rated at 60 dB min and 70 dB typical. The short haul control station combiners cover all LMR operating bands, both transmit and receive in one unit from 100 MHz to 1000 MHz, making it highly adaptable. As with the standard CSCs, there is no minimum frequency separation limit, as both units use non-frequency specific components in their construction. Be sure to review the power ratings on either unit before putting them in your site. TXRX Systems produces many models of duplexers for use with control station combiners. The use of duplexers further reduces the number of transmission lines and antennas on the tower by combining or duplexing two or more CSCs onto a feed line and antenna. Some CSC models have duplexed output, combining the transmit and receive signals in the unit while others send out separate transmit and receive signals. The duplexers listed allow efficient use of outside resources. The TXRX multiband or crossband coupler shown can be used to couple multiple frequency ranges onto a single transmission line. The coupler allows VHF in the range of 30 to 180 MHz, UHF from 330 to 520 MHz, and 78900 MHz and above at 746 through 1.3 GHz to be coupled through a single unit. The model is designed for applications that are slightly lower in power handling approximately 30 watts continuous. A great deal of thought and engineering go into site design, both before and after the site is up and operating. Nothing is left to chance when first responder and public safety lives are involved. Once the coverage area is clearly defined, the number of sites needed will be established, dependent upon factors such as the frequency range of the system, the topography of the area, and a host of other items. Tower locations may be limited to existing structures or to available property. Height, tower type, and other considerations are now part of zoning and planned communities and regulations. Transmitter output power and antenna selection will have major impact on coverage. Frequency planning includes what is currently in use, what is in use nearby, and what is in the system that represents a high power threat, such as remaining broadcasters. 
TXRX Systems has been working with first responders since 1976, providing infrastructure products such as combiners, including control station combiners and duplexers, antennas, and tower top amplifier systems. A leading innovator in custom solutions in VHF and UHF, TXRX, now paired with Comblin, an international corporation, produces radio infrastructure equipment for several major OEMs in the LMR industry and has the capabilities to work with you and your team to design and supply your infrastructure equipment. TXRX Systems has a full-time staff of field services engineers and technicians ready and able to assist in solving your site issues. Before the design work begins and after the problems start, TXRX Systems and Comblent are here to help you with your site needs. Thank you for being part of this training module, for inquiring about TXRX Systems and Services, and for being part of our technical community. This section was intended as a continuation to Land Mobile Radio's sites, systems, and equipment. It is not intended to be an in-depth training, but is the second part of a series covering site basics. More training modules are available in support of this and other topics specific to products manufactured by TXRX Systems. The material is available in short versions and in longer half-day, full-day, and two-day classes. Visit our website at txrx.com for more information. Titles and topics are being added weekly, so please come back often to see what is available. Classes are available at TXRX Systems 8625 Industrial Parkway, Angola, New York, or if your group or shop is large enough, we will bring the training to you. Please call 716-549-4700 to discuss fees and scheduling. Again, thank you for being part of this presentation, and we do invite you back.